Hey, welcome to 12 Tone. 1991 was arguably the last most important year in the history of rock music. Not the only most important year, mind you, but I'm not sure we've really seen anything quite like it since. 91 marked the mainstream arrival of alternative rock, a more serious, down-to-earth response to the increasingly cartoonish antics of the arena rock acts of the 80s. It saw the breakout success of many of the movement's most influential bands, as well as early efforts by rising stars who would go on to guide the scene through the rest of the decade. At its core, 91 was a hard reset on what what rock music was in the public eye, presenting a new vision for the genre that endures to this day. And while the most important album in that process was probably Nirvana's Nevermind, I think there's a good argument to be made that second place belongs to the Red Hot Chili Peppers' Blood Sugar Sex Magic. It was the band's fifth studio album, but only their second with what would eventually become their signature lineup, including guitarist John Frusciante and drummer Chad Smith. Blood Sugar was a radical departure from their previous work, creating a new sound that would define the Chili Peppers for the rest of their career. It's an ambitious, inventive album, and today I'd like to look at what, to me, is probably its most enduring song, one that showcases the emotional depths that existed beneath the band's energetic, often juvenile exterior, Under the Bridge. Let's take it apart. The song starts like this. So let's look at the chords. We're going back and forth between D and F sharp, two major triads, a major third apart. That's a really special relationship. The two chords share one note in common, in this case F sharp, and then the other two notes are a half step apart in opposite directions, with D moving down to C sharp and A moving up to A sharp. That gives us perfectly balanced, symmetrical voice leading, so neither chord feels harmonically higher or lower than the other. Instead, we have this serene, almost sedated progression that barely feels like it's moving at all. No other pair of major triads has that. You always move more in one direction than the other, unless they're a major third apart. But that stillness is contradicted by the melodic aspects of Frusciante's playing. In each bar, the first three beats are an arpeggio with a vague upward trajectory, but then the last beat is a clear, deliberate walk down to the next chord's root. And that walk down seems to be really important. I think the most obvious thing to do would be to walk down, then back up. That lets you fill the space more efficiently, and it ties in with the balanced motion of the progression. But Frusciante doesn't do that. Instead, in the second bar, he starts the walk from a high F sharp, going so far as to overshoot the target D and slide back up in order to make sure he gets the descending line he wants. Combine that with the chords, and you get an intro that's not going anywhere, but it's still going down. Or, okay, he doesn't always play the walk down. Every other D chord, he replaces it with this where he slows down, moves up a little bit, but then falls all the way back down anyway. So what does this all mean? Well, the song is about singer Anthony Kiedis' struggles with addiction and depression, and to capture that, the intro creates this sense of descending numbness, a musical impression of the spiral of addiction. With just the walkdowns, we'd see how empty that place felt, but it's a failed attempt at a walk up, even when the distance is so much shorter, that shows just how hard it is to escape. That leads into the verse, and the first thing I want to look at is the first chord. Again, we've been going back and forth between D and F sharp. From a voice leading perspective, these are the two closest major triads, so it says a lot to suddenly shift to E, the furthest major triad from both of them. It sits directly between them, a whole step away from each, and it's impossible to voice lead smoothly. Best you can do is slide all the notes a whole step in the same direction. When I listened to this song as a teenager, this transition always felt super awkward and jarring, like they were throwing out the intro and starting a whole new song, and I'm pretty sure this is why. Not only have we changed keys, we've changed to a chord that refuses to fit with anything we've heard previously. It's really uncomfortable to listen to, which sets the stage brilliantly for what we're about to hear. In terms of chords, the verse alternates between two forms, and I'd like to start with the second one. This is a really classic chord progression in rock, often called the Axis progression. If you've seen that medley by the Axis of Awesome of all the different songs with the same four chords, this is that. It's a nice, simple backdrop that does its job without calling too much attention to itself. There is one little flourish, though, which we see in the first half. <laughs> 
This is the same thing, but instead of going straight to A at the end, he sets it up with a rhythmic figure and a brief trip to G-sharp minor. Normally in the axis progression, the move to the last chord is fairly soft, so adding this extra chord in between helps make the arrival on A feel like a bit more of an event, changing the vibe of the loop by introducing some stronger harmonic motion. But again, the chords aren't a huge deal here. What matters more is the accompaniment, that is, how those chords are played. In this first verse, Frusciante is mostly just holding them to leave as much space as possible for key his vocals, so let's look at those. Sometimes I feel like I don't have a partner. What's most interesting to me here is the melodic structure. The first two phrases set up a pretty clear expectation. The first ends on E, the root, don't have a partner. Well, the second ends on F sharp, the second. My only friend. This tells us we're gonna be alternating between a nice stable resolution and a less stable point implying further motion. It's a pretty normal melodic structure, and the third line plays along, ending basically the same way as the first. City of Angel. But then the fourth line goes rogue and ends on E again. Together we cry. Like it's just kinda giving up, the forward momentum of the line suddenly dies. And more than that, this E isn't even really resolved to. In the first and third lines, it's approached by step from F sharp. Partner. But here we just waffle around in thirds from C sharp. We cry. And speaking of breaking expectations, the line doesn't even rhyme. Not with anything we've heard so far, anyway. It does rhyme with the end of the second verse, but those lines are so far apart that, for me at least, it's pretty hard to catch that in the moment. This all gives the melody a sense of defeat, like he's starting to do something and then just decides it's not worth the effort. I mean, what's the point? There's no one around to care if he tries. And to really drive that home, the whole song stops for a moment, hanging on this rich, complex E major 7. I'm on the record as not being a huge fan of major 7 chords, but this particular use is beautiful. It plays to the chord's strengths with a sort of wistful dissonance that comes from the blend of a bright major triad and that crunchy major 7th interval, all of which is made even more nuanced by the layers of overdrive and compression on the guitar. If you really want to capture that sense of sitting passively in your own emptiness, this is the chord to do it. From there, we pick back up into the second verse. Most of the stuff we talked about still applies, but the accompaniment has started to change. Instead of holding chords, Frusciante starts adding in all these little fills. To convey a sense of anxious energy that complements Kitas' story of wandering lost through the hills of Los Angeles. This is also where Smith joins in. playing mostly hi-hats with a cross stick on the backbeat. This emphasis on the cymbals gives the percussion a shimmering quality, like a haze that sits over most of the song. Even as he introduces more of the kit, he keeps the hi-hats front and center supported by those sharp wooden cross sticks. It feels mellow, but like so much of the song, it has an uncomfortable edge to it that keeps the line from fully settling. That brings us to the chorus, and I'd like to start by looking at the melody. I don't ever wanna feel like I did that day. I don't know about you, but to me, that B feels really unstable, and the C-sharp feels pretty resolved. That's the opposite of what we'd expect in the key of E, but it's exactly what we'd expect in F-sharp, because, yeah, I think we've changed keys. If we turn our attention to the harmony... It's another fairly common chord progression in rock. Theorists call this a double plagal cadence, but whatever, I don't care. All I care about is that we're in a minor key. Or, okay, technically Dorian, but again, whatever. It's minor enough. Now, it's not unusual for a rock song to change tonalities in the chorus, but it is unusual to do it in this direction. It's much more common to see a minor verse leading into a major chorus, and at first glance, that seems like it'd fit really well here. After all, the verses tell the story of Kiedis living through the worst day of his life, while in the chorus he's reflecting back from a healthier place. The verse is the sad part, so shouldn't it be the minor one? Except... No, it's not. As someone who struggled with depression for most of my life, I can tell you that when you're truly at your lowest, you're not sad. Not really. Being sad takes effort, and you don't have any to spare. You put on this thin veneer of existence just to get through the day, but underneath the surface, you're empty. There's nothing there. It's only once you're past that, when you can look back on where you were, that you realize just how dark it really was. 
and that's what the song captures so beautifully. The verses aren't the sad part. They're major because in that moment, Kiedis doesn't care. He can't afford to. He just needs to score. Nothing else matters. That's why I don't really care that this progression is like a textbook example of a double plagal cadence or whatever. It's not important. What is important is that these middle two chords, the E major and the B major, are the same two chords that started the verse progression. They are, in a very literal or at least heavily symbolic sense, the way he felt that day, just in a new context that allows him to create distance and to safely reflect. So no, the minor tonality in the chorus isn't sad. Or, I mean, it is, but that sadness is an act of healing. It's a necessary step on the way back up. And they drive that point home with the accompaniment. I'm gonna play the first bar of the chorus, and I want you to listen to how Kiedis' vocals line up with the guitar and bass. I don't ever wanna be. Did you catch it? Yeah, they don't line up, at least not to start. Kiedis is singing a really simple rhythm with a clear emphasis on the beats. I don't ever wanna feel. Prashanti and Flea, meanwhile, skip the first two beats and play offbeat stabs in between. It's not until we go back to the E chord, back to that dark place from the verse, that they finally start to agree with Kiedis' phrasing. This gives it a stumbling, uncertain quality, as if, despite knowing that he needs to change, he's not quite sure if he can. It makes it clear that he's not recovered. He's just in recovery. Speaking of Flea, this is where the bass part comes in, and since it's Flea, we should probably take a look at it. It's actually pretty restrained for a Flea bass line. After the initial stabs, he falls into this consistent eighth note pattern that mimics the rhythmic simplicity of Kiedis' part. He hits the root of each chord as it changes, then jumps up to a high B before setting up the next chord's root with a note a whole step away. Honestly, this kinda reminds me of a walking bass, with those approach notes creating a sense of continuity that gives the line a clear, consistent trajectory. Combine that with a relatively wide range and constant motion, and you get a bass part that, while simple, is still lively and exciting. It's a musical reflection of the more vibrant life Kiedis has found through his sobriety, the life that he wants to hold on to. This leads into the third verse, which is a lot like the second, but Flea stays in, holding down the roots of the chords. Kind of like Frashanti's part in the first verse. This, along with some accompanying kicks from Smith, creates a fuller musical texture than previous verses. That's not unusual or anything, later verses tend to include more parts to keep things interesting, but the contrast here is pretty striking, and it makes this verse feel a bit more… alive, for lack of a better word. From there we get another chorus, and then we find ourselves in the bridge. Or maybe bridge isn't the right word for it, we're gonna be hearing some version of this section for pretty much the rest of the song. Frashanti loops the same two bars for like a minute and a half, so maybe there's a better name for this section, but given the lyrics, I think it's an interesting piece of musical wordplay for the song to end with a long, drawn-out bridge, so I'm just gonna call it that. I hope that's alright. Anyway, let's look at the chords. <laughs> These last three are easy, that's just a walk down the A minor scale. But what about the A major? Well, that's doing a couple things. When we first hear it, it's a pivot chord. In F sharp minor, the chorus key we were coming from, A major is the flat three chord. It belongs to the key, so it doesn't sound out of place following that progression. It smooths out the transitions between the two tonalities, so we don't have to deal with F sharp minor and A minor right next to each other. <laughs> Once the loop gets going, though, it takes on a new function. Remember how in the intro we had two major triads a major third apart, and that created a special kind of harmonic relationship? Well, the progression ends on F major, so going back to A major means doing the exact same thing. <laughs> This time, though, the motion isn't quite so balanced, because on the way back to F major, we have to pass through the rest of the progression. Specifically, we have to go from A major to A minor. This is another special harmonic relationship, although perhaps a more obvious one. Playing two chords with the same root but opposite qualities creates this really subtle sense of contradiction. You're not moving, but something's changed. On its own, that change could seem too small to really be impactful, so Kiedis reinforces it by leaning on the third of each chord, starting with the two different kinds of C, oh, no, no, no. and then settling down to the shared root A as the progression continues. Yeah, yeah. By using the melody to emphasize the clashing tonality, he elevates it to a strong enough position to clearly make its point. The bridge is also where Smith abandons his hi-hats and cross sticks and finally gives us a full drum beat. 
His kick pattern is also no longer aligned with Flea's bass, instead marking out its own rhythmic layer full of 16th note syncopation against the rest of the band's primarily 8th note based rhythms. This eruption of percussive energy after the restraint he's shown all song announces pretty clearly that we're at the conclusion, and it raises the stakes in this final section. Once they've established the loop, we get a brief interlude with some more of those rich complex major 7 chords. <laughs> After which the outro really begins. Kiedis is joined by a choir led by Frashanti's mother Gail. singing a new set of lyrics over the chorus melody transposed up to fit the new key. It's a massive ending, the end result of all the slow orchestral buildup they've been doing throughout the song, but that's kinda weird, right? I mean, this is the climax, the part the audience is gonna scream along with at concerts, and yet the lyrics aren't triumphant. They're not about Kiedis' success at leaving his addiction behind, they're about that day. Under the bridge downtown, I gave my life away. That's dark. It's painful. So why is the arrangement so exciting? Honestly, I'm hesitant to read into this too deeply. As much as I love assigning narrative meanings to every little thing, I do think it's worth taking a step back sometimes and making sure I'm not just inventing stories out of thin air. Ending on a climax is pretty typical in rock song forms, and the choir makes the lyrics a little hard to understand anyway. So yeah, maybe this means nothing, and if that conclusion satisfies you, I totally get it. Your interpretation is valid, even if your interpretation is just that this thing doesn't affect your experience with the song. Throughout this video, I've left out plenty of details that just don't matter enough to me to be worth mentioning. That's how analysis works. But hear me out. Maybe it doesn't mean nothing. Maybe, and I'm just spitballing here, but maybe it means something. After all, this specific arrangement was still a choice, and intentional or not, choices communicate ideas. So if we were to try to understand this choice from the perspective of the song's narrative, what might it be telling us? Well, what I get from it is the same thing I've been getting over and over throughout the song. He's not out. Not yet, and possibly not ever. This triumphant celebration of his lowest moment shows just how much hold that day still has over his life. The euphoria of reducing all the complexities of human existence down to a single objective, and then achieving it? That's hard to shake, no matter how much it cost you. The story here isn't one of triumph over addiction. It's survival in the face of addiction, of constantly facing your own temptations and refusing each day to let them win. Kiedis wrote the song after only a couple years of sobriety while he was still trying to work through all the scars his actions had left. He'd ultimately relapse again later in the decade, but eventually he'd managed to get clean, and by all reports, he's been sober for over 20 years now. I don't know if he still thinks about that day, but as dark as this song gets, Gets. It's nice to know the real story has a happy ending. And hey, thanks for watching, thanks to our Patreon patrons for making these videos possible, and extra special thanks to our featured patrons, Susan Jones, Jill Sundgaard, Duck, Howard Levine, Warren Hewitt, Kevin Wilimowski, and Grant Aldonis. If you want to help out and help us pick the next song we analyze too, there's a link to our Patreon on screen now. Oh, and don't forget to like, share, comment, subscribe, and above all, keep on rocking.